The scripture reading today is from Proverbs 18 and Acts 2. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their belongings, <coughs> possessions and belongings, and disturbing and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Christ. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben, for reading that passage. Um, it's a delicate transition from Todd's announcement into this sermon, and we'll definitely be praying for Buzz and his family, and I hope, uh, hope some of you can make it out there for that. Um, <clears throat> my name is Russ Ramsey, and I am the pastor uh, of Christ Prez's Cool Springs location, and so I get to be a part of the team here. I've been, uh, this has been our, our family's church for a number of years now, and i um, uh, and I'm thankful to be able to preach here uh, for my friend, uh, Scott, who is out of town. And uh, this sermon, I've preached it at the Cool Springs location as well this morning. I've been kind of bouncing back and, and, back and forth. And, and the same uh, subject and the same text, a sermon is being preached at Music Row. We've been doing this Worship Connect Serve series together across all three congregations. And uh, we've been... We've been you know, each sermon has been a little bit different, but there's been a, a particular point of application that has that we've shared from every uh, congregation, and uh, so each sermon has had one one point that we've really really focused on. And I want to review quickly where we've been, and then catch up to where we are uh, with today. And so the first week, we, the first two weeks, we focused on worship. So two sermons on that. And the first thing, the first point of application or ask was this: be fully present with the church every Sunday, that this would be a regular part of the rhythm of all of our lives as a part of this community, that we're better together uh, when, when, we're, when we're all here. Uh, then the second week, we focused on this, and this is kind of the Monday to Saturday uh, emphasis, if you will. It certainly applies to Sunday too, but be, faith, be fully present with Jesus every day, that we would be people who would be as individuals committed uh, to studying scripture and to prayer. And then we, we've moved now into two sermons focused on the word connect. Uh, and last week we talked about take every opportunity to gather with your group. And this is assuming and presuming that we have a group and that we're finding our people. And, and there are a lot of ways that you can do that and you can get connected here in the church. But that we would be a people who would not just treat church as a, as a commodity, as a place where we go and, and receive a service and then, and then go our way. But that we would be people who would be connecting relationally with other people here. And then this morning we focus on this one. Befriend and bring in people who do not have a church home. Now, if you've been around Christ Pres for any amount of time, there's nothing new about this. We're a church that has always been uh, committed to being an outward-facing church. Uh, we're, we're committed to the idea that, that, that we're Christians in public, right? That, that if, if you're a believer in Jesus, a follower of Christ, you're part of a local community, you're studying scripture and praying every day, this is such a part of your life that it's, that it's almost impossible for anybody to really know who you are without knowing that part. And we're only too happy to share that part. And so this is an extension of that. Befriend and bring in people who do not have a church home because you do. <laughs> and so we're going to focus on this right here and we're going to unpack it. And what I want to do is, this, there's, there's nothing clever about this sermon. It's right down the middle of the plate. Um, and uh, it's even mercifully a little short uh, because, because of that. Um, but here's what I want to focus on. Is I want to focus on this question. Befriend and bring in people who do not have a church home. What are we doing when we do that? What exactly are we doing? Why does this matter? When I was a sophomore in high school, I grew up in a small town in Indiana named Tipton. And I became a part of a youth group in high school when I was a sophomore that was zealous to tell people about Jesus. It was a non-denominational, charismatic church, and I got into this group of people. They loved me well, and it was an exciting thing to be a part of. And it wasn't just that the youth leaders were all 
fired up for Jesus. It was that all the kids were too. It was, it was, it was amazing. I rem- Does anybody remember Hosanna Integrity worship cassettes? Does anybody remember cassettes? <laughs> so these worship cassettes had a slow side and a fast side. And our worship time at, at, at church would be one of the sides of the cassette. And we never knew if it was, are we going to be like just jumping up and down for Jesus? Or are we going to be beating our breasts and, and just really reveling in the, in the, in the tender mercy of, of our Lord? But we would do this. And I remember early on as a part of this youth group being invited to the church. Hey, we're going to gather on Friday night in the youth room. Everybody come out. And we're going to go street witnessing and so what we did is we, we huddled up there in the youth room. We pumped each other up with Bible verses like, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Remember, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we would get in each other's faces almost like we were listening to Journeys Don't Stop Believing. And, and, and then we would go to Main Street downtown where the boys in their Camaros and pickups would be cruising up and down the strip like David Wilcox sang six lights down and six lights back, pacing like a lion in a cage. And the girls would be hanging out at the polar bear or the pizza shack. It was just like a Mellencamp song, my town. And we would go and we would, two by two, because that's how you do it, uh, and we would walk up to somebody that we would find on the street and we would ask a question. Have you heard the good news? If you were hit by a bus tonight, do you, know if you're, do you know where your soul would go? You know, questions like that. And after about an hour or two of doing this, we'd meet up at the pizza shack and we would share our stories from the evening. And it was rare, but sometimes one of us would say, I, I, I prayed with somebody today and they, received, they accepted Jesus into their, into their heart. And then we would all celebrate outreach. Let me stop and ask a question. Are you uncomfortable? Does what I just described make you feel like, "Mm, I'm not doing that. Maybe you've done street witnessing before, but listen, I can accept that this kind of witness has value. I can accept that the Lord works through it. But what I can also tell you is that from my perspective, as I was doing it, my approach had a fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw was this. What we were after was converting as many people as we could there on the street. And when they, if they, said amen, we would congratulate them on, becoming, on having become a child of God. And then we would walk away to go get together with our real community and celebrate what the Lord had done through us. And here's what we failed to understand. To come to faith in Christ is to come into a community of faith in Christ. To come to faith in Christ is to come into a community of faith in Christ. And speaking for myself, I didn't have a lot of interest in actually befriending the people I was witnessing to. I didn't really want to spend time with them. I wanted to win them so that I could go away and celebrate with my friends. At Christ Pres, we are committed to being an outward-facing church, that we would be Christians in public, and we believe that our city has this always-growing, always-deepening need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a growing city. The statistic people have been throwing around for a while is 100 people move here a day. I don't know if that's an up-to-date statistic, but it's a recent one, and we're not slowing down. It's not like it's not growing anymore. And so we're asking, in a church that believes in being public with our faith, outward-facing, and our city is growing, There are people without a church home who are either moving to town or asking ultimate questions about the meaning of their existence. And we're saying befriend those people and befriend them and bring them in. Bring in people who don't have a church home. What does it look like? Does it look like the evangelism of my youth? Probably not for most of us. But our text from Acts gives us a better and a deeper vision. What do we see happening in this passage that we just read 
One of the things that we see, interestingly, is we see these believers doing the first three asks that have been a part of this sermon series so far. We see them doing these things. What do we see? We see that they were fully present in corporate worship, that they spent time in scripture and prayer, and that they gathered with their community. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing in this passage from Acts 2, 42 to 47. We just, you see it there, and we're going to unpack it a little bit. And what happened when they did this? They grew. Their community grew. The Lord added to their number daily. Let's look at it. Be fully present with the church every Sunday. The church grew in their worship of God. Verse 46 tells us that they met daily for worship. And one of the things that we see here teased out is there were both formal and casual parts of their worship, and both were good. Both were holy. Their formal worship consisted, they went to temple, they shared the Lord's table together in the breaking of bread, they were devoted to one another in prayer. Their casual worship, I love the language here, let's not let it be missed on us, especially as a church that has a high value uh, when it comes to parties, as it says this, it says that, they, that their worship consisted of meeting in homes, eating, quote, together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And so here's what the picture is. They're people who prayed and they shared and they sang and they ate and they drank and they enjoyed each other. And you sense that their worship was this mix of deep reverence for God and hearty laughter with one another. It's a beautiful picture. Be fully present with Jesus every day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to Scripture, Acts 2.42. This means that these weren't people who were saying, let's all get together and pool our spiritual preferences and come up with a club. Instead, what they were doing is they were giving their attention and their focus to a careful study of God's word. They were praying. They were placing themselves under the authority of Scripture and locking arms together to walk in it. And so they were each individually, they had a vested interest in studying and being present with Scripture and Jesus every day. Take every opportunity to gather with your group. They shared everything they had in common. It wasn't communal living because we see that they had homes You know, people had homes and some had things that they would give to others in need. So it wasn't like just a big community chest where everything was kind of all mixed in there. Instead, what we find is a group of generous people. They're generous. They're generous with those who have need, with how they can help, because they understood Jesus' teaching from Luke 12, that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So they were all in with each other. Get this picture of the community. They were all in with each other. They were invested in one another's well-being. They were in each other's homes. They were up to date on each other's stories. They were committed to showing up for each other. They helped where they could. And what formed? A pretty unbelievable rich community. An intentional community. One that was centered around scripture and devoted to God and devoted to one another. You see it right here, right? And this community grew. How did it grow? They talked about it. They bore witness to it among other people. This kind of community is rare in this world. It's rare. And they had it. So they talked about it. And that brings me to the heart of what I want to say about befriend and bring people in who don't have a church. When we do this, when we befriend and bring people in who don't have a church home, we're not merely inviting people to church. We're inviting them in. We're inviting them in. We're inviting them into our community. Saying, come be a part of this. By the way, I'm there. It's my community. Verse 47, I love this little detail in the text that just kind of goes by if you're not paying attention. But it says this, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. What I love about this is when you read the text, you notice that study, fellowship, worship, these are listed as the activities of the people. But this one, the adding to their number daily is God's work which lifts the burden of responsibility off of us 
to convert a single person. The Lord does this. The Lord is building this community of faith. However, how? How is he building a community of faith? Are these just kind of people wandering in off the street, kind of zombie-like drones? I'm not sure why I'm here, but I feel compelled to knock on the door and see what's going No, that's not how it works. God, who can do anything he wants and does, is a God of means. He uses us because he wants to. And that's such a privilege, such a privilege that the Lord would use you and he would use me to tell people about a community that is life-giving and to invite them in and to see them become a part of it. It's outreach. I think about this in my own life, how the Lord builds community. He does the work. He gives us our friends. I look around this room right now. I've got Matt Amy up there in the balcony, and I've got Danny Rader right over there, and I've got Henry Thomas back there grinning at me because that's what Henry does. And Brandy's over there. Brandy Kellett, Joe Eberly's up in the booth. Kyle Banks is back there. Jesse Isley is over there. These people... I love them. I love them. I would not know them if it wasn't for the church. There would have been no way for our paths to cross. Not all of us. But I love them. A few years ago, I didn't know them. But now I do. And I think, you know, Lord, as long as you have us in community together, we walk a road and we'll get to know each other better. And we'll know each other's great gifts We'll know each other's deep struggles. We'll know each other's stories of where they were and where they are and the processes they went through to get there. And it's just an incredible gift. Now think about that. Who are those people for you? And then imagine one year from now, that list having four or five other people that you don't know now, but the Lord is bringing into this community because the Lord adds to our number. What a sweet gift the Lord gives It's outreach. Evangelism is a word we could use for this. That word can carry some baggage with people, but to simple, simplify that word down, here's what evangelism is. Evangelism is truth-telling. For the Christian, it's telling the truth. It's bearing witness. What does it mean to bear witness? It's like, like, a, like a, um, a, a, somebody testifying on the stand as a witness. It's, it's somebody saying, hey, I have firsthand experience with something. I've experienced it. I've walked through it. I've seen it. I was there, and I'm telling you that experience and and what I saw. That's what it means to be a witness for Christ, that we're able to give a reason for the hope that is in us because it's in us. And it's a process that God is then pleased to use in us, even though he clearly doesn't have to. But what does he say? Go. Go. And the Lord added to their number daily, the Lord. Sometimes evangelism looks like standing on a street corner. Striking up a conversation with a stranger, leading somebody through a plan of salvation. But for most of us, what it looks like is it looks like inviting people into our community, inviting them in and saying, hey, listen, I'll I'll be there and I'll, I'll look for you. It's a good place. Lifeway did a study a couple of years ago. And the study was kind of around the question of whether... Um, evangelizing was offensive. And one of the things they found in the study is that in general, when non-Christian people or people without a church home were asked, would you be upset or offended if one of your neighbors or friends or coworkers invited you to church? The answer was overwhelmingly no. No, they would not be offended. Why? The answer actually makes a whole lot of sense. It's this. If, if somebody knows you, and they care about you, and they're in a relationship with you in some way, and, you, and you, you're rubbing shoulders together in life in some way, they're going to have some interest in what makes you you, right? What do you do? What are your hobbies? What do you like to do on weekends? What makes you tick? And so they're going to be interested in knowing what you care about. And to a certain measure, they're going to care about what you care about because you, mat- you matter to them, and that matters to you. Consider when you invite a person to church what you're inviting them into. Now, sure, no church is perfect, but if 
as a church, we're taking seriously the things we were talking about, that we would be a community of people who are committed to one another, we're committed to scripture, we're committed to prayer, we're committed to growing in our relationship with our creator and our redeemer, which must necessarily be marked by committed to growing in humility, then that's a community that we're inviting them into. We're inviting them into that. This world is a lonely world. In a lonely world, the church is meant to be a place where people love one another, where we show up for one another, where we lock arms. We walk through seasons of life together. In a world where it can be so hard to make sense of meaning and purpose and truth, the church is meant to be a place where people are committed together to learning about our merciful Savior, our perfectly wise creator. In a world where it can be so hard to find relational peace, where there's so much drama, the church is meant to be a place where the community keeps short accounts. We seek unity. We confess. We repent. We forgive. And so when we invite someone to church, the hope is that That's the kind of community we're inviting them into. What we're saying is, look, I may be a work in progress, but I'm telling you, I know a place. And I'm loved there. And I'm committed to loving others there. And I think you would benefit from this community. And also, I think that you would have something of value to add to that community. So come and join me there. Now, If we don't take seriously the things we've been talking about, if we don't take seriously worship and scripture and prayer community, and all we're really doing is consuming the church, then the invitation isn't going to carry a lot of weight. Instead, what we're going to be inviting them into is what it is for us, and that's a commodity. A place we go a couple times a month. But when, for us, our church home is a source of life, of peace, of personal growth and spiritual growth and challenge and satisfaction in worship and communion around the Lord's table, well, then our invitation invites a person into so much more than just a church service. We invite them into our community. This is my place. And I'm inviting you in with me. And we're eager to see them taste of the things that we've grown to love about this place. And we're eager to grow with them in that. So befriend and bring in people who don't have a church home. I'll just bring them to church, bring them in, into community. And the Lord will add to our numbers, not to merely grow a church, but to deepen community. And friends, we get to play a role in that. And we get to do it our entire lives. And that's amazing. Let me pray. Father, I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for how easy it was for me just now to look around this room and name eight friends, people that I love and people that I anticipate coming to know more and more over time. And I thank you for the, 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 the grace of giving us the local church. And yes, Lord, there, there are many criticisms to draw against organized religion and local church and abusive leaders and all these things, and it's not to take anything away from any of that. And yet at the same time, the church was your idea And you speak of her with affection. And you call us to be one body made up of many parts, regarding ourselves as your beloved. And so I thank you for that. Lord, I pray uh, that you would give us eyes to see the opportunities that are around us to extend an invitation to people without a community like this, like ours to become their community. And Lord, we thank you in advance.
for the amazing, wonderful, talented, quirky people that you will bring into our midst who will sharpen us and strengthen us and give to us as we give to them and sharpen them and strengthen them. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.